Welcome to today's groundbreaking discussion. This is Channels Beam, where curiosity meets conversations, taking us a step further into the future we desire. I am Sunas Nathaniel, and today we are delving into the transformative potentials of rural literacy and gaming in classrooms as pivotal keys to securing Nigeria's digital future. From remote villages to urban centers, empowering every Nigerian child with literacy skills opens doors to digital inclusion and economic opportunities. But that's not all. Integrating gaming into classrooms revolutionizes education, fostering critical thinking and technological fluency essential for navigating the digital landscape. So join us as we explore how these innovative approaches you know, intersect, how they ignite imagination and pave the way for a digitally empowered Nigeria. Get ready to unlock those doors that brighten more connected future. We'll be right back. Don't go away. I want to be able to express myself without fear or shame. If I am helped, I believe I can. To read, speak, and write is a right. My dream is valid. Thanks for staying with us. Our Spotlight video takes us right into the heart of the subject of the day and also gives us a hint as to our distinguished guest with whom we'll be discussing how rural literacy, gaming in classrooms, can serve as pivotal keys to securing Nigeria's digital future. Joining me here in our Abuja studios are two highly cerebral individuals who are key players in educating and re-educating the future generation using innovative methods. First, I have Mrs. Stella Uzochuku Dennis, an electrical and electronics engineer who is an educational technologist and currently serves as director of the ODC Educational Foundation. Also here with us is Mr. Sam Wokoma, a researcher, data analyst, and development sector consultant who serves as founder of Soul Fitness Center, a non-governmental organization and direct youth intervention geared at influencing young people in character and career development. Ladies and gentlemen, you're both welcome to our program. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. Uh, let's get right into it. We have very little time for this discussion. So I'm going to start with you, Uncle Sam. They, they usually will refer to you as Uncle <laughs> Sam, uh, those, those, who, those who you mentor. Uh, the first question for me is going to be very simple. Having labored for quite a while, you know, in this space, I mean, literacy in rural, develop, in rural areas, uh, what are some of the things that you have discovered, especially within Abuja and maybe across? Uh, what are the things you have discovered and how does it affect, uh, how does it affect the way you apply? you know, your, your research, how do you apply it to helping those children in those locations? Yeah, okay, so um, thank you very much. The working in the rural communities, because we took the initiative to work with rural communities, especially where it is difficult for parents to send their children to school. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found out, about, because first of all, we, had, we did a community mapping to find out to the the extent of the need. Mm. And one of the things that he revealed was that even in the cities that are very close to Abuja, you know, as uh, metropolitan and urban as Abuja is, cities close to Abuja, you want to suppose that it should, that will not be the case for serious extreme, uh, extreme uh, low literacy levels. But that was the case. Mm. Now you see young children between the ages of five and 18, who are so passionate about education, who want to go to school, that's their desire, but their parents have no means to send them to school. So that gave birth to the Independent Rural Literacy Initiative, where we try to go into the communities, develop what we call community learning hubs, mm. and maybe sometimes a community walk-in library. We stock those libraries with books, and then from time to time move volunteers and friends into those communities to help these young people read. Because for us, if you can read and write and comprehend, then more than 50% of life struggle is almost settled. Mm. 
Because being able to read gives you awareness, gives you that level of self-consciousness. So you begin to see people who have an ability to refute, being indoctrinated, mm. being uh, cheered into uh, negative vices. And you see, begin to see a glimmer of hope. When people can read and can express themselves, they, they begin to have hope. They're able to expose themselves to a bigger world because through books you can assess the bigger world out there. So you begin to see that this changes the concept. So but one of the major challenges we have faced is the integration, the cooperation with the the gatekeepers of these communities. Because mm. oftentimes for us to enter these communities, we have to go through uh, community leaders, we have to go through the, the issues, we have to go through the village heads and the community heads. And oftentimes, it's quite a whole lot of roadblock. Everybody, people oftentimes believe that such activities must come with some level of intervention and there's a whole lot of um, de uh, unspoken mm. uh, demand for incentivization of mm. some sort. So yes, we have to you know, find a middle ground. So what we do oftentimes again is we look for people who we call champions in the community, maybe um, more younger adults who have gone to, who have NCE, who have gone to school or who like to teach, or who are in the teaching profession and we make them our champions in the community. Mm. So they become the point people. They, they are the custodians of the libraries and the community book spaces. So they offer these books to these children. So we walk through them to mm. assess them. So by, by so doing, we kind of like broker it and for a stipend, anyway, to support them. So it's more like we are empowering a child of your community to be a champion for the children of your community. Beautiful. So those challenges are there. So on, on the bigger scale, this is um, quite a big challenge. Because if this is the case for cities that are very close to the urban centers, then what happens to the cities that are far away mm. from all forms of modernization? Because we're going to be talking about technology. Yeah. So In how fact, close? Thank you. You have brought that. Now let's let's ask ourselves: How do you leverage? I mean, staying with you, how do you leverage technology to increase that literacy rate? You know, in these rural areas. Okay. Um, right now, we have we have not. We have the dream. You know, in, if on on the blueprint of our design, it is our desire that in time to come, we'll be able to get partnership support to be able to set up beyond just uh, community working libraries. They can also be some form of tech hubs, a place where ch young children who can be able to come in and assess basic technological skills, uh, computer skills, um, internet access, learning to write, learning to use the internet for, for learning, learning to assess uh, learning resources online. But for now, we don't. We, we it have could, not. could it be because you are saying that the basic thing of they being able to communicate, they don't even have that? Could yes, that that's it. So the first thing to do is to give the opportunity for a child to be able to read and write and comprehend. Mm. Once you can read and write, I mean, one of the slogans of the Rural um, Literacy Initiative is that your, 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 your desire to read and write is a right. Mm. It's a very valid one. All right. Okay, let's, let's, let's go away now a bit from the rural uh, to the urban centers. Uh, Mrs. Stella, uh, please tell us, explain to us how this experiment of bringing in gaming into the classroom is a game changer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every classroom should be a place where mm -hmm. every learner should learn the way they want to learn. Mm. If you want to lie down to learn, I mean, if it is music you want to listen to and learn, we should have that opportunity. And that makes it possible for every form of learner, mm. all the types of learner, uh, learning um, um, attributes comes in. So it's necessary for us to be able to put this, infuse this into a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, when you see some of these children who, uh, into, who love to game while learning, uh, it becomes, and we need to beg them to eat their food when they come with their food. And some parents told me that I should please take away this gaming from their children mm -hmm. because it's making them want not to, I mean, they don't even watch TV again. They don't want to go to bed because they have a game they have to submit or they have to write to be able to um, come to school the next day. And one thing we have also done is to ensure that um, you help to build the game you want to see. Mm. That's what we have done for some of the children. I mean, they start as earlier. We take them the 
various either coding languages or we teach them the platforms which they can use to game. And then most of them, maybe they want to add one plus one. I mean, as little as that, they begin to, I mean, if you get it, uh, you get maybe a rose or a, a, a golden bowl or something. You just get something. I mean, gamifying it, making sure that everybody is involved. I mean, we have seen a lot of them wanting to stay back in the school or wanting <laughs> never to go home. It's again. good that you have come there, especially when you <laughs> mentioned the parents. Yes. Now let's ask about those things, you know, the balances, the criticisms, the are you sure this is not just going to be the impact of the child just wanting to, to gain rather than gain the actual knowledge necessary? Uh, what, do you say, what do you say to that? Well, how do you speak to that? No, I don't think so. Because um, for a child to build a game, first of all, I mean, start from the ones that build their games, you have to know the answer and you have to know the questions. That means you have learned that particular skill. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, you don't, I mean, even we have a very um, early stage of uh, maybe chemistry, um, if you add um, um, hydrogen to um, oxygen, what does it give you? I mean, if it's this a plant cell, if this is this, this shape, what is it? I mean, you need to know it for you to be able to build a game. And then even when you don't build a game by yourself and you play this game over and over, you don't want to be beaten to mm. it. Mm. You don't want to be beaten to it. So you see people even going ahead to read subjects, I mean, to do some research before they come to class when they know that there's going to be a gaming class Mm. the next day. So we have seen that a lot of students have actually um, gone beyond, out of their um, comfort zone mm. to learn because um, we, nobody wants to be beaten to the game. I agree. Um, yeah. So because we do actually games for the classroom curriculum. Mm. Like we have plant cells, you have to be able to say what a, a cell wall Xylem can do. Yes, you have to know all that. So when you're playing the game, when, when the, maybe the attribute comes up, you're able to say what it is and what it's used for. All right. And then if you're not able to do that, then mm -hmm. uh, you You know that you, you're beaten to the game. Yeah. I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Sam, what does this kind of learning say to you about how far out the rural communities are? I mean, it's, and the case for Nigeria. I mean, it speaks so much. It speaks so much about it. We we incorporate board games at the rural level, and and it is not far from what she has shared. Mm. The foundation is that where there is a memorable experience, yeah. learning is. Possible. All right, I will hold you there because we're going to come back to you. I'm going to take you from that. We'll be taking a brief break now, and when we return, we'll be looking at strategies to overcome language barriers and promote literacy in diverse linguistic communities, as well as the ethical considerations of gaming in classrooms. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching The Beam coming to you live from our studios in Abuja. Our guests, Sam Wokoma and Stella Uzochuku Dennis, are still here with us. And we're still looking at rural literacy, gaming in classrooms, and how they can serve as pivotal keys to ensuring and securing Nigeria's digital future. Uh, just before we went on break, uh, Mr. Sam, you were speaking about how this dichotomy in what she has just said about using the games in the room and yeah. what the rural communities experience, how, how it really talks to what Nigeria is and where we are really at the moment. Yeah, so, so, so the, gap, the gap is wide, but, but let's dwell on the advantages and mm. the, the beauty that this adds. So what, what she mentioned is this, and this is it for me, that, and I was saying that memorable experiences, especially for young people, young people who are learning, when they can have memorable experiences in the practice of learning. And that's one thing that games bring in, mm. be it board games, be it IT supported games, codes, you know, programming, because the, the power of programming is you put codes together and then you see an output, an outcome that is so wow, and that it doesn't just wow you, it wows all the people around you. Now that's a memorable experience for you. It drives you to do something more. Mm. So that kind of feeling in learning is a driver. So if you want to break the, if we want to break that, that ice around literacy, we must be able to bring in this kind of innovation. Now, bring it to the rural place. Now, in the rural place, mm. there is no access. Oftentimes, there are no access roads. I mean, we assessed a rural community um, not too far, not up to five kilometers out, uh, away from the FCT. Mm. And we had to park at some spots and then walk the other way in. So there are no access roads. There are no good 
um, there are no uh, good water. Mm. There, there are, there's no electricity. Mm. Now, if there is at all, you can imagine what it is. So, now, how do you support tech in such a community? There's mm. no security. And sometimes you want to put up these uh, learning hubs in these communities, and your first fear is security because you put these things together, will it be there till the next day? Mm. So, it, so you see the, the gap. So gaming and games in as, as a tool to drive literacy is key, principal, I mean, and it's a researched method, it is working. But how do we achieve this without first achieving the first building block? So if, talking about the Nigerian situation, and that's the Nigerian situation, it's quite a wide gap, mm. a wide gap that needs to be closed. Mm. How can we close partnership, partnership with individuals, organizations? I mean, there are several organizations who, who push their corporate social responsibility yeah. into other areas. Now, if you ask me, I would say that maybe by some form of either advocacy or by some level of legislation, there should be a huge level of demand or of, uh, or, of drive from corporate organizations mm. to push social responsibility towards other alternative means of educational support for rural, for rural communities. All right. I stand uh, on that. Let, 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 that's a very good place to actually stand. But, but let me just take it before I come to her. How do you break the language barrier? It's a problem. You know, we have, we have so many languages and you're going into communities where these children, like you said, yeah. are not literate enough to communicate. Yeah. How do you break those barriers? Now for us, um, this, this has worked for us and this is practical. It's what we do. In Nigeria and indeed the world today, mm. English language is the super lingua franca everywhere across the world. And Nigeria, that is our official lingua franca. Yeah. So English language in our literacy initiative is the first, is, is, is key. Now, we, we started adopting recently on the curriculum to include at least one Nigeria. indigenous language, okay. especially of the community where we're penetrating. So if, for example, we're penetrating a community in Okeila, for example, which is one that we have been visiting recently, thinking of an intervention, if that is a Yoruba speaking community. So while we're teaching them English language, mm. teaching them to read, write and understand English language. And our focus is age five to 18 because th that is formation, basic secondary age. So the, the concentration is teach them to read English language. Mm. The language barrier is a problem, yeah. but the global language is English. So the focus must be teach them to read English language. Yeah. And then you overcome it All right. by making the books available, giving them volunteers in the community. If they cannot go to school, create community uh, working libraries, community learning hubs, give them volunteers or, or maybe personnel who can help these young people read and write. They exactly. must not know mathematics. Everyone must not be a doctor. Everyone must not be a, a lawyer, mm. but everyone must be able to read Right and comprehend. All right, I'm going to be closing with you. Uh, what are the ethical considerations as somebody who develops these games? What are, in a very short while, just tell us, how do you, what are the ethical considerations, especially looking at the kids we're dealing with? Yeah, so um, that's why a lot of times we don't dwell 100% on the, um, um, the software games. We, we, we blend it because uh, a child is not supposed to be exposed to screen over more than six, five hours a in a day. whole day, yeah. yeah. So we try to reduce that because we have other things apart from the gaming that we use the screen or the um, TVs to um, show. So we try to reduce that. And then we also make sure, that's why we're putting the children on the table where we're making this decision. Hmm. What is best for you? Yeah, so we're considering everything and making it very, very inclusive. It's about the we're, child. Yes, it's about the child. So we're making it inclusive and ensuring that the child is involved in ensuring. It takes time to, right. to build a whole game just for one topic or this thing. But we make sure uh, we also reduce the timeline. Like in the class, the whole time should not be allocated to game. Gaming. It mm -hmm. should, we should have some time of theory. We should have some, some time of play. We should have some, I mean, around just all the balance. The, yes, just all right, balance. Uh, friends, we have to go. Uh, Mr. Sam Wokoma and Stella <laughs> Uzotuku Dennis, it's been a wonderful time. I wish we had more time yeah. because there's so much we could have said about this discussion. Yeah. But please, thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, it's a wrap on today's uh, episode of The Beam. Thank you very much for staying tuned. And as always, we'll be leaving you with our five most viewed videos on our YouTube. I'm Sunas Nathaniel. Until I come your way next week, let me in the fashion of Martin Luther King Jr. say, 
that I too have a dream that someday the child in the rural community would be able to academically stand shoulder to shoulder with the child in the city. And together, with their brilliant creativity, they will help Nigeria secure a solid, digitally empowered future. Bye for now. Nigeria is a very rich country. We have no reason whatsoever to be poor. We have no reason to be hungry. We begin this week's most viewed videos countdown with an interview in which Professor Usman Yusuf laments over Nigeria's economic crisis, saying it is saddening that Nigerians are turning into beggars. Leaders are of our time, like I said. I mean, they were better custodians of that which they were entrusted with. The primary problems of all we are going through are two things. Corruption and bad governance. End of story. Say no more. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, I am emotionally drained, so I'm not going to try to do anything uh, that requires my emotional reservoir, because I'm not too sure there's much for me to draw. Coming in the fourth place on our countdown this week is a clip in which Nigerian business mogul, banker and philanthropist Aiboje Aikimokwede pays tribute to the late Herbert Wigwe. Let us rise up in unison and begin to send a clear message of appreciation to this general. Whenever you are tired, you can stop, stop, stop clapping. But let's start. In third place, we stay with the tribute in honor of Mr. Wigwe, and in this clip, we see Mr. Aiboje tear up as he speaks of the great feats attained by his brother and friend. But there are very few people in the world whose life and legacy illuminate this commitment the way Herbert Wigwe has. Some have told me in the last few months, Herbert was very concerned about the state of our nation and our continent. This is indeed true. And Herbert knew, ladies and gentlemen, that time was not on Nigeria's side, nor is time on Africa's side. If he was here today, Herbert would share these words with you. And Paul will remember. In second place this week, we still come to a video from the Night of Tributes held in honor of the former CEO of Axis Group. In this clip, we see former governor of the Central Bank, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, break down in tears as he mourns an icon who, he says, has come to become a brother from a budding friendship. I was thinking I would die and leave Herbert. <laughs> refer to him as Dr. Herbert, or probably doctor, forgive me. And at the top of the spot this week is a video which is not unconnected with the death of Mr. Herbert Wigwe. In this clip, Wigwe's personal assistant reveals how luggage issues prevented him from being in the ill-fated flight in which Mr. Wigwe, his wife and son, and a friend, lost their lives. Like I said, I always reason in the line of duty. And I walked up to him, I said, sir, I think it's safer and will be secure for me to just ride and bring the luggage to you. It's a brilliant idea. And I said, safe flight. 